I think if we look at Western philosophy as a way of discovering guides for living, one of the major lines that we would have to see threading its way through Western philosophy is that ideas matter. And if we're going to talk about the meaning of life, the avenue to discovering that meaning would be through ideas. For the Greeks, the ideas were of the sort that as spectators we would come to contemplate. And that might raise us beyond the normal world as we understand it. But from the Greeks and religions in the West have added to this and complemented it and even become rivals to it, it's the idea that not only do ideas matter, but the meaning of life is in important ways, literal or metaphorical, found beyond this world. By the time we come to Hegel, history matters utterly. But the history Hegel talks about is a grand intellectual odyssey. And we are both in it, but can also tell a story about it that allows us to appreciate that grand intellectual odyssey, that journey of history. And of course, whether it's the Greeks or if it is Hegel, a grand vision is presented. Now again, in our last two lectures, we've looked at a great alternative to that. Or is it an abysmal one, a very pessimistic one, where ideas do not finally matter because life itself does not matter. And we saw through Schopenhauer the idea that it is disengagement from the world and from allowing life to agonize us that constitutes what meaning life might have for us. But let's now consider guidance in living, as philosophy might hope to provide it, can be understood as seeking some form of escape from the world, or as seeking conquest of or reconciliation with the world. In any of these alternatives, the world we find ourselves in must be understood for what it is. Now, influencing Karl Marx greatly, a German philosopher who lived from 1818 to 1883 and actually lived most of his adult life in London, for Karl Marx and influencing him greatly, not only negatively but positively, was how Hegel understood our very human nature and how Hegel understood that nature to be bound up in socio-political and economic circumstances. The early Hegel, the exciting Hegel whom we've talked about before, who wrote The Phenomenology of Spirit in 1807, had a very positive influence on Marx, a very positive influence. And this Hegel saw circumstances as often in need of a very, very dramatic alteration. And in fact, we talked about that in relation to a famous passage in Hegel, which is referred to as, and written as, freedom and terror. And it involves in this early Hegel, who so influenced Karl Marx, three possible outcomes. One outcome was this, that there could be, if our legitimate needs weren't met, the requirement for a kind of revolution. But an outcome of that revolution might well be that we have nothing but chaos in the wake of a radical revolutionary change. And another outcome that Hegel thought was possible if we sought our freedom through radically overturning things was that we could come into a situation that was worse, not better. And a third outcome, and the one that mattered most to this early Marx, was that we would reach a situation if we took the revolutionary step where circumstances would be better. The early Hegel thinking at least three outcomes were possible a revolution ending in chaos, 
a revolution ending in a worse situation and a revolution ending in a better situation. It's funny. This Hegel thought that the French Revolution was the right thing to have done. He said it had many terrifying consequences, but we learned a lot from it. And Hegel actually thought that the book he wrote, The Phenomenology of Spirit, reflected on and figured out what that revolution meant and could understand what the right outcome would look at and look like, whether the French had specifically reached that outcome or not. So this early Hegel, the Hegel who thought revolution was, in a way, a very, very dangerous thing to undertake, but at the same time filled with possibilities, this early Hegel very much enchanted and inspired Marx. Let's consider further, because something happens with the work of Hegel. That is the work of a later Hegel, about 20 years later, who is a very negative influence on Marx. He's a de negative influence because this Hegel celebrates the virtues of Prussian society and claims that the structures of Prussian society were supportive of our human identity and required no essential alteration. If the early Hegel thought revolution was a very precarious undertaking but might need to be done, the later Hegel thought there was no need, there could be piecemeal reform, everything was fine. Now famously it said that if Hegel found in middle-class Prussian society a heaven in the 1820s, Marx found in it a hell. Marx believes that institutional arrangements of the world in which we find ourselves often, and he was the thought Marx had in his time, they often do not reflect. They don't respond to human need, and they don't speak to the potential of our human nature. Thus, Hegel's later philosophy, Hegel's philosophy of the 1820s, which said that society as it was now constituted was supportive and spoke to, acknowledged and recognized the rational, essential nature of human beings, Marx was enraged by that. To him, that was just simply false. It was very cozy. It was very conservative. It was just awful. Marx saw the dynamic and courageous spirit of the early Hegel giving way to a self-serving, smug, complacent, and highly inequitable conservatism. The circumstance in which one doesn't find oneself acknowledged, recognized in and through institutional arrangements, that circumstance in which you're supposed to be mirrored, acknowledged, and recognized, but you're not, Marx refers to as alienation. And Marx thought that we lived, if we were in Marx's time, in a very alienated world where the institutions and circumstances around us do not speak to us, do not recognize us, do not acknowledge us. How to understand alienation? Perhaps it's best understood as follows. We are alienated if we're disconnected from circumstances, from something to which in an important way we belong which is meant to be supportive of us. And though we're meant to belong and that is meant to be supportive of us, if it doesn't support us, then we are in a condition of alienation. It is essential to us, but somehow we are disconnected. It does not speak to us. It does not nurture, sustain, and support us. Yet we need it. If that's the circumstance, we are alienated. And Marx thought that we lived in a state of alienation. The socioeconomic circumstances and dynamics in which a person is enmeshed, Marx thought, were often circumstances that were, in this sense, alienating. Philosophers often take our basic relation to the world to be the most revealing and the most important indicator of our own nature and of the world's most basic features.
Now, as we know, Hegel, Kant, the grand Western rational tradition, understood our pivotal relation to the world to be in terms of thought. I mean, after all, Hegel confirms the Western valuing of rational comprehension as our highest capacity. And in both the Greeks and Hegel, it's importantly spectatorial, though Hegel directs such knowledge toward the concrete, social, and cultural world of his time. Not beyond it, but Hegel thought we could absorb and live fully rationally comprehending through ideas the world we live in. And as we've looked at before, Hegel by the 1820s actually believed that the world in which we found ourselves, and for him that was Prussia, that it incorporated the completion of history. If you mean by history the unfolding of the ideas that could and do matter to the human spirit. And Hegel, as we know, understood knowledge as a continuing, recapitulating, and reintegrating, and absorbing, and appropriating of what already can and is known in the richness of its full content. But for Hegel, for the tradition, the world that's revealed that way, those features can be and must be pervasively and constantly the object of rational comprehension. Let us pause for just a moment. Let us pause to consider. There's a famous remark Marx makes, and it's helpful to note it. Marx says, what we need to do is not understand the world. He actually thought that in important ways the world was already understood. Marx thought that the basic problem was to change the world because who we are is dependent on how life in the world is for us. And if we're to believe Marx, we understood all too well what our life in the world was like. And if that should really matter to us, the way our life in the world was for us was not good. And philosophy told us what that world was like. But Marx said the business is not just to understand the world, it's to change it. We must change it, and philosophy can't bring that about. So the meaning of life is not going to be found through philosophical knowledge. It's going to be found through a kind of acting that changes the world. Well, Marx understands our most crucial and our most revelatory relation to the world to be through work. The word often used is labor. We don't really have an adequate term that explains to us exactly what Marx had in mind. I think we understand it easily from our ordinary experience. If the grand philosophical tradition thought thought was the most important thing and that that was what mattered, Marx thinks that our concrete, practical engagements in the world express most fundamentally our own natures as human beings. Because our true nature as human beings is not to be thinkers. It's to be agents, unavoidably, and deeply constitutively involved in productive activities, work activities, that are often and importantly cooperative. And that such work activities are not the lower part of our nature, the higher part being what matters and that would be thought. No, the engagement through the activity of work, what we call labor, is something that reveals us as we really are and what it reveals as well is a very malleable world of socioeconomic relations and forces and the natural world through the work we do is drawn into that. The materials of the world become part of that. And what Marx tells us is that ideas, the fancy things that philosophers bounce around, they actually are derivative from this matrix of relations and forces. We should consider this for a moment. We should pause. We should think about what Marx has told us because it represents an extraordinary change in philosophical thinking.
we are now told that our actual, and let's even use this word, our ordinary life in the world, our life as workers, hopefully as productive agents involved in work activities, that's where we find the real world, and those activities in that real world, those are the activities that are and reveal to us what our nature is. We're not minds and bodies, and our minds think. We are bodily beings who work, and the kind of work we do in the situations in which we undertake that work, those are what make us who we are, what we are. And if philosophy, as Marx thought, could do little, if anything, about that, then maybe some other kind of activity would be necessary. Some other kind of activity that would do something about the world in which we work if that world is a world that's not just discomforting, but alienating. If it's a world that does not recognize and acknowledge and allow us the full and free expression and working out of our talents, of our abilities. Let's consider further. Marx has a diagnosis, a diagnostic understanding of this alienation we have, the alienation in which the world in which we live isn't supportive of, doesn't nurture our abilities and talents. And that understanding of our alienation involves at least three sorts of circumstances in which a separation occurs. We're, in a way, disengaged or alienated from ourselves, and we are not in touch with our true underlying nature. Uh, he talks about this in a very engaging way. Uh, in a positive, non-alienating circumstance uh, where we are working in the world, the something, the product that results from our activities. Uh, we have productive activities and a product comes from them. Marx thinks that in the best circumstance, that product, well, it should be made in the way we would choose to make it, and the product, when completed, should be ours, and we should be entitled to dispose of it in the manner in which we choose. If this occurs, then we have used our talents as we would wish, and we have been involved productively as free and self-determining beings. And Marx says, if we were to live in that world, and Marx thought in his time we didn't, the result, the product that we would make in our own way, on our own terms, could then be construed as an expression of our talent, an expression of ourselves as producers, it could be viewed not just as a product, but as a dimension of ourselves. It could be construed as part of the very matrix of our nature. Now, the activities that are involved and the results of these activities, the products that we do, that we bring about in our work, they're understood by Marx to enter into the very constitution of us as people who are their producers. Through such activities, people, Marx believes, have the opportunity to become who they really are, much more so than through the ideas and thoughts that people might happen to have. Marx, and this itself is revolutionary, construes ideas and thoughts as mere epiphenomena. That is to say, impotent results of underlying activities, but not contributors to these activities. In other words, only effects, not causes. If Hegel and philosophers have thought that ideas move the world, Marx actually thought that the world in which we are enmeshed as employees, as workers, 
That is the real world, and that is the world that determines ideas. It is not ideas that move the world for Marx. It is the actual world in which we find ourselves engaged in work that produces, whether we are willing to see it or admit it, the ideas that we live by. Marx not only believes that work is central and that the products we produce are so important and that we must be able to produce them in our own way, Marx also thinks that if we're to be truly liberated, if we are to be our true selves, and if our talents are to be realized, our time must be our own. That is to say, everyone's time must be subject to the timing and the partitioning of time that one oneself chooses. One's time must belong to us. We must not belong to time. Even as early as the Stoics, probably before that, we have the notion that our relation to our own time is most intimate, and to give it over to someone else is to impoverish ourselves. There are really two essential questions that we should ask regarding time, and they're important to focus on. Does the time in which we live belong to us, or to us, does it belong to someone else? Does the time belong to us, or do we belong to it? There's an important experiential distinction between clock and existential time. We live by the clock. Sometimes we're altogether tyrannized by the clock. And then we belong to a time external to us. But there's another sense of time, which is existential time. We don't pay attention to the clock. We have time belonging to us. I'd like to pause for a moment to tell you uh, an important story that arises out of a Greek philosopher, Seneca, viewed as a Stoic. Seneca makes a remarkable statement. He says, there are all kinds of possessions that we have that we would not think of giving over to anyone else. But what's most precious to us is our time, and we're giving our time to other people all the time. And isn't that an extraordinary oddity that things not quite so intimately connected with us as objects we might have, those we don't give away. But what is most intimately part of us, our time, we tend to be generous with. Seneca thought that was a great problematic paradox in human life. But now think about it. Marx says if our talents are to be expressed, if they're to be realized, we must live in a world not only where it is in the way we choose that the products we produce are produced, but Marx says we must live in a world in which the time in which we do what we do is our time. It is not given over by us or sold by us to someone else. But of course, Marx, we know, is a critic of capitalism. And the capitalism that Marx chose to see was a capitalism in which we're tyrannized by those with the money to pay, who employ us, and those of us who work are employed and with the money given us, and in return for that money, sell our time to someone else. Marx thought that the world in which he lived in England in the 19th century was an exploitative world, a world in which the capitalists, who turn out to be, on his view, the bad guys, dominate human beings, paying for their time, and therefore, at least metaphorically, enslaving people who must sell their time must sell the way they do things to those who pay them. And if you sell your time, if you sell the way you do things and you give over the products of what you do 
to the one who employs and pays you. Then supposedly that person tells you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And that leaves aside what your talents might be and the possibility that maybe the real meaning of life is finding a way to express and use those talents as you choose in your own time and in your own way. Could the meaning of life being, could it be finding a way to live in a world in which that was possible? Is that realistic? Well, whether it's realistic or not, for Marx the meaning of life would be to live in a world where you would express your talents as you wished, produce as you wished, and your time would be your own. And to the extent that didn't occur, you would live in an alienated condition. Now, in the positive condition, the non-alienated circumstance that Marx extols, not only is what you produce yours to produce as you wish and your time your own, the relations that human beings sustain with each other are concrete existential relations that are fully human and involve a wide range of aspects. Think of it this way. Marx thought that in a society where money was what altogether mattered, relations were primarily relations between buyer, seller, producer, consumer, and there's a whole network of capitalistic arrangements that determine who does what and when. And the underlying human meaning of these things get lost. Production becomes everything. Consumption becomes everything. And able, in order to make it able to work efficiently, what you've got to do then is have mass production. You've got to have lots of money to hire lots of people who will do things as you tell them that they must be done. And Marx thinks in such a world, not only do we get ex abstracted from who we are, also we get alienated from what our underlying talents might be. Almost in passing, Marx says that not the least of the human relations that are sustained are between man and woman. And even as early as the 19th century, he worries that these relations can be subject to economic determinations. Marx reacts critically to a matrix of relations that sorts out primarily in economic terms. He is very concerned, as I've just mentioned, that if we live in a world where it is buyer-seller, economic competitor, producer-consumer, employer and employee, if that is the primary way in which we are taken up into life, well, then we are not living a concrete human life. And a concrete human life is what ultimately matters. So what then does Marx tell us diagnostically? Let's consider what he does tell us diagnostically and go further. He tells us that when all is said and done, ideas are the results of circumstances, not the creator of circumstances. Marx tells us that what we think is determined by the kind of life we live in a world of work and that the ideas we have are a result of work arrangements. Marx tells us that if those arrangements do not speak to our talents, do not give us the freedom to develop as we wish, allow us to produce as we wish, and allow our time to be our own, that that world in which we then find ourselves must be changed. Philosophy won't be able to change it. Something else will be required to change that world. And perhaps what might be required is a radical, revolutionary alteration of that world. Why does Marx think that's needed? Because maybe only then our true talents can be expressed. And if the meaning of life is how we are in the ordinary world as workers, 
then probably we'll have to look, aside from philosophy, we'll have to look at how the world is structured and what probably we will need to do is to undertake activities that will radically change it. Where do we find the meaning of life? Not in ideas, not in withdrawing from the world. For Marx, we find the meaning of life through the radical change of the world that supposedly would liberate our genuine talents. Is this an unrealistic dream? Is this a misunderstanding of what human life is actually like? Uh, is this a dream that has no future? Is this a dream that is not realistic? Or does Marx tell us something about what the true meaning of life could be if the world was arranged in a different way? In our next lecture, we'll look into these questions about Marx and about the direction Marx takes further.